This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. As they make their way toward the top of the stretch, and then it's Miss Frost and Speed Seeker on the outside, cutting the corner a little bit. Sassy starts to get going, and then Testa Rossi, Kiss Moon still there. Kiss Moon, the leader, in front by three. Spring included second. Testa Rossi is closing up the inside, and the far outside is Sparkling Review. And then extreme outside, Lady Laura, Kiss Moon. Here comes Sparkling Review, right on by. Sparkling Review and Julian Leparu have won. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Asano. On this morning's show, a plan for California Chrome. We'll take a look at a couple of pretty impressive performances. We'll give you uh, three turf fillies to watch for next year, and we will welcome in a trio of special guests, beginning with Mr. Graham Motion, and we will discuss his Breeders' Cup victory of main sequence, We'll talk to him about his starters on both coasts today. Then we will welcome in Mr. Jim Cassidy, who's got the lightly raced Ocho, Ocho, Ocho for this afternoon's million dollar Delta jackpot. And finally, a first timer to the show, Mr. Brendan Walsh, who's got Biddy Kitty making her stakes debut in this afternoon's Cardinal on the grass at Churchill Downs. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us. For this, our November 22nd edition of the program, which is being sponsored by Bloodlines Racing. Racing quality horses like Invading Humor and Distorted Beauty. And for information on their newest offering, the half-sister to both of those, visit them on the web at bloodlinesracing.com. Good morning once again. Welcome to our November 22nd edition of the program. As I was driving in this morning, the temperature gauge on my car read 19. <laughs> that says it all. Settle in, relax, grab a second cup of coffee, stay warm. I think we've got a good show for you right up until 11 o'clock. We open the show with some sad news this morning. Tom Cunningham, the former Albany Times Union sports editor, columnist and handicapper, died on Thursday at the age of 84. Tom worked for the TU for 37 years. And one of the things he enjoyed very much was handicapping the Saratoga races, something which he was very good at. Our condolences to his family and friends. Now, I hope you were watching last week and hope you enjoyed our interview with California steward Scott Cheney. He was not only very, very well spoken, but he was very willing to share information, something which has been lacking in this sport for decades. Cheney has an interesting background, as he was at one time an assistant trainer to Daryl Vienna before going out and getting his law degree. Now, California stewards had a meeting on Tuesday, one day before the California Horse Racing Board met. And it appears that the wording for the rules of racing concerning disqualifications may very well be changed in California. And I think that's a good idea. Because California stewards are asked to speculate a great deal. And I've always felt that a foul should override supposition from the stewards. All of this, of course, coming on the heels of the controversial decision in this year's Breeders' Cup Classic. Now, at Wednesday's California Horse Racing Board monthly meeting, one of the commissioners suggested, and folks, I don't think he was kidding. I can't be 100% sure, but I'm as close to 100% as I could be. His suggestion was that coming out of the gate should be, and I'm quoting, open territory, end quote. In other words, every man and horse for himself and no fouls should be called coming out of the gate. 
Now, if he was serious, and I think he was, that's got to be one of the most bizarre statements I've ever heard coming from a racing official, and I have heard some beauties. <laughs> so I think we're going to see some change because of what happened in this year's Classic. Now, California Chrome had his first workout since finishing a close third in the Breeders' Cup Classic when he breezed a half mile this past Monday at Los Alamitos. With Victor Espinosa aboard, California Chrome covered four furlongs in a pretty effortless 47 and 4. Now, a very important work will occur tomorrow morning at Del Mar when the Derby and Preakness hero will work on turf for the first time. And according to Art Sherman, if California Chrome handles the new surface well, he will run in next Saturday's Hollywood Derby on grass. But if he doesn't work well on the turf, Art may run him in the Grade 3 Native Diver on the main track on the same day instead. Now, a couple of things. Unless, I don't know why they would even consider the Native Diver. You know, unless he wins that by 8 or 10 or 12 in a romp, I don't think it will do him a great deal of good when it comes to the Eclipse Awards. It's a grade three versus mediocre older horses, and I don't know why he needs that. I'm personally hoping he goes in the Hollywood Derby because there's an unusual element involved here. Generally speaking, in turf racing, saving ground, at least for parts of a race, is very important. That means relaxing inside of horses is a key. Well, as we have seen, California Chrome, at least on dirt, doesn't like to race inside of horses or in behind horses. Now, we don't know if that would be different on grass, where you don't get nearly as much kickback. But if California Chrome has to race outside of horses on turf as well, that could be a major detriment at some point. Now, whether he can overcome ground loss against the type of field he's likely to meet in the restricted Hollywood Derby, that may be different. But, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about horses going to grass for the very first time, immediately look at pedigree. I'm not nearly as worried about his pedigree to go to turf as the way he likes to run. So turf racing, it's not ideal to have to race outside. Pay close attention to that Sunday morning workout at Del Mar to see where California Chrome will go next. Fellow Cal-based runner Renee's Got Zip, a multiple graded stakes winning sprinter, has been retired. Trained by Peter Miller, Renee's Got Zip won half of her 16 career starts. Her final race came in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, where she finished ninth. And welcome back to Honor Code, one of the more exciting three-year-old prospects early this year. Honor Code went to the sidelines with a suspensory injury in late March. The Remsen winner will make his first start since March 12th in today's sixth race at Aqueduct, an allowance Optional claiming event at six and a half furlongs. Approximate post time for Honor Code's return is 2.45. All right, a couple of impressive performances from the week past to look back at. Last Sunday at Aqueduct, a big performance in an entry-level allowance from Liam's Map, number five who is in front. A three-year-old son of Unbridled Song, out of Miss Macy Sue, the latter a winner of nearly 900000 as a sprinter. Now, Liam's map debuted with a runner-up finish in the opener on Travers Day at Saratoga. He then returned to break his maiden by nine and a half, a month later going a mile. And here, at that same distance, and despite being quite anxious early on, he ran that opening quarter in a rapid 22.66. Liam's map would go on to an impressive 11 and a half length romp in 135.69. Now, after the opening 3.8s, Liam's map appeared to settle better. 
and never had an anxious moment. He will be spending his winter in South Florida, where many of us would like to be. And we will likely see him in a Gulfstream Stakes going eight, eight and a half, or nine furlongs. Todd Pletcher trains this $800,000 purchase who, if he can learn to harness his speed early, could ascend through the ranks of the older horses in 2015. A good-looking performance from Liam's map last Sunday at Aqueduct. Another performance of note took place in last Saturday's Mrs. Revere Stakes at Churchill, and it came from Sparkling Review, number four, seventh in the two-pack in the red silks. Now, a couple of things I always look for in grass races. How a horse moves without the rider asking or scrubbing on them, and what kind of a turn of foot does a horse show? Well, despite racing in traffic, which prevented Julian Leperu from really turning her loose until well into the lane. Sparkling Review traveled very well until Julian found a seam. But it was at this point where Sparkling Review did something which not a lot of horses can do. She accelerated very strongly and very quickly, and in a matter of strides, inhaled the leader in one going away. It was visually very impressive, and when you factor in that this lightly raced filly was only asked for a brief period of time, the performance was worthy of special mention. This was only her fifth career start. She's now four for four on the proper surface. She didn't beat any monsters in there. And the race was restricted to three-year-olds, but I really liked what I saw. The only thing I didn't like <laughs> was her price. She was 10 to 1 in the program. Now, I didn't think she'd be 10. I thought that was a poor line price. But I thought she'd be 6. She did go off at a high 4 to 1. In her race before at Keeneland, you know, we spoke to her trainer, Ben Colebrook, on last week's show about this. She was 30 to 1 in the program in the Valley View and went off at 7. So the line prices have been poor. But this is a serious filly who people are betting. So the only thing, in my opinion, not to like about uh, the Mrs. Revere was the price. Now, we've got three turf fillies for you to follow for 2015. In alphabetical order, they are crown queen. Billy Mott's, and she will be an older filly next year, she is a half-sister to Royal Delta. She captured the Queen Elizabeth II at Keeneland. She won twice at Saratoga. Now, she's a light-bodied filly. Hopefully, she will grow up some during the winter, but she is an extremely talented turf filly. Lady Eli, Chad Brown's juvenile filly's turf winner, will be a three-year-old next year. In all likelihood, she will stay in the three-year-old division because, folks, when you have a three-year-old grass horse, whether they're male or female, you can run against restricted company throughout the entire year, with the exception, of course, if you want to go to the Breeders' Cup. Then you've got to race against older horses. So I would expect Lady Eli to be facing restricted three-year-old fillies for a lot of next year, and she is extremely exciting. And then there's sparkling review from one of last week's guests, Ben Colebrook. She will be an older filly next year, and I really liked what I have seen the last couple of starts from sparkling review. Now, there are a number of spots on the internet. I think Daily Racing Forum still does it. Brisnet may do it, Equibase may do it, where you can go and sign up for stable mail. Why don't you do that? Put in Crown Queen, Lady Eli, and Sparkling Review. They will send you notices of when they work, when they're entered to run, 
and when they do run, they'll give you the chart of the race. So even though we're going to keep an eye on them, you know, obviously, here on November 22nd, for me to be talking to you about these Phillies, I like them very much. But you can stay right on top of what's going on with Crown Queen, Lady Eli, Sparkling Review, and whoever else you want to put in your stable mail. So uh, that's free of charge as far as I know. So go and sign up, put those Phillies in, and we'll see uh, what kind of 2015 each of them has. And we are up to our first break on this morning's uh, chilly November 22nd edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. When we return, it's off to, I assume, much warmer Southern California to welcome in Mr. Graham Motion. As we go to this break, the Commonwealth turf restricted to three-year-olds. The solid favorite at even money, number five, heart to heart, who really figured to be the controlling speed. So we will take a look at the Commonwealth turf to the break, back with Graham Motion right after these messages. They're racing in the Commonwealth turf. And a good start for the favorite Heart to Heart. Heart to Heart right to the front. On the inside comes Archway to Heaven, who's away running in second. He's in front, is right there, along with Other Cheek and Bashert on the far outside. They're followed by Captain Dixie, Woodfield Springs, racing about four lengths off the lead early and down on the inside of horses and a little bit tight there as they slow things down up front. Shivarayan is after that, and then comes Waliana to the inside. High ball is next, and then Affordable, and De facto is the trailer. 23 and 3 was the opening quarter mile for Julian Leparu and Heart to Heart. And they lead the way up the back stretch with other cheek in pursuit from second on the outside. Archway to Heaven is third along the hedge and just off the leaders. Then Bashert to the outside. He's in front is next. Captain Dixie's got five lengths to make up and races outside of horses. Then two lengths more back to Woodfield Springs. Affordable high ball de facto on the far outside. Waliana and Shiva Ryan at the back after a 47 and two half mile. Into the turn they go and heart to heart continues to lead the way. Other cheek on the outside. Still second. Bashert is third. Archway to Heaven ridden along in fourth for more. Captain Dixie follows in fifth, and then it's he's in front, and high ball, and they're into the stretch, and Heart to Heart is getting away. Heart to Heart, running strong, coming to the eighth pole, opening up a five-length lead on other cheek, and then Bashert to the outside, and they're all far behind Heart to Heart, who comes down to the final 16th with a four-length lead, and Heart to Heart and Julian Leparu have gone all the way in the Commonwealth turf. Other cheek held second, and then Bashert and Highball. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off Track Betting. Looking for a racing partnership with proven success? Bloodlines Racing is for you. Using genetic profiling, Bloodlines horses are bred from some of the most successful thoroughbreds in the world. Horses like Distorted Beauty and Invading Humor have won six of their last seven races over the summer and together have delivered to our partners more than $366,000 in earnings. For our latest offerings and opportunities, visit us at bloodlinesracing.com. Bloodlines Racing. Racing quality. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. And heart to heart for Brian Lynch, Julian Leperu, a stakes double, wire to wire by a pretty easy three and three quarter lengths over other cheek who chased throughout in the Commonwealth turf. Our first guest this morning did an absolutely superb job with Main Sequence, the winner of this year's Breeders' Cup turf and the leading candidate for champion turf male. He's got a busy day in front of him on both coasts, runners in Southern California and South Florida, and we welcome in live via telephone from Southern California, Mr. Graham Motion, Graham Marcusano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. 
Hi, good morning, Mark. Thanks for having me. Graham, congratulations to you and your staff on the great job with Main Sequence. Well, I think he, all, he makes us look good. Um, you know, he's a remarkable horse. I, I don't, I've never had a horse put back-to-back -back group ones together like he has. It just says a lot about him, I think. He first came to you. And I'm pretty sure he got sick on you early on. But other than that, what were your first impressions of him? You know, he's not a, a, an overly impressive-looking animal. Um, but sort of the more I did with him, perhaps, the more I liked him. And, and then, you know, I remember in particular the last time I, the week of the, the, the United Nations, I just gave him a little blowout. And I just told Robbie Walsh, his exercise rider, just to let him go 3-8 through the lane, and I think he sort of galloped through the lane in 35 and changed, and we both kind of looked at each other like, well, that was sort of unexpected, you know. Um, so I think it's the more we did with him, the more impressive he became, and, and, and I think even with his races, that's been the case. And, and Graham, I mean, he won the United Nations, the Sword Dancer, and the Joe Hirsch, despite having gait issues. That's not easy to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the Breeders' Cup, he really put it together. And I, I was concerned in the Breeders' Cup that if he spotted the field length like he had in his previous start, it was going to catch up with him. Because you can only, you know, as the competition gets tougher, the waters get deeper, um, you can only get away with so much. And, and the fact that he handled him so well, himself so well on Breeders' Cup Day, I think that, that really turned the corner for him. And we're going to look at, at the Breeders' Cup turf in a moment. But, Graham, I thought Rajiv Marat did a particularly good job for you in his first three races in this country because despite the gate issues, he rode them with patience and with great confidence. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think that's been a big part of this course's success is the, is the way Rajiv handled him early on. I, you know, had we not had the rides we had in the first couple of races, I don't think we would have had the confidence in him to do what we did. And, you know, Rajiv was really a team player. Johnny, Rajiv, and I had a conference call the week of the Breeders' Cup, and we just hashed out, you know, his races and his issues, and, and, and I think that was a big help for Johnny on the day. Well, we are about to take a look at the final three-eighths of a mile of the Breeders' Cup turf, main sequence, and the white cap for our audience, widest of all. Graham, your third Breeders' Cup victory, second in the turf. Talk about this outstanding performance. Yeah, I mean, when, when they turned into the stretch, uh, you know, first of all, when Johnny got him in a good position early on, I felt very comfortable about where he was, and I felt very good about the race. But when they turned into the stretch, you know, I, I really felt the horse was going to win. I didn't think it was a question. Um, he was traveling so well. Johnny just had him in a perfect position all the way. Um, and then there was a, a brief instant just before the wire when I thought the Judmont horse was coming back. But I think this was by far his best performance. Yeah, Graham, when he got to Flintshire and went by him, it looked like he idled for a few strides. Is he, does he have a tendency to do that? He does. I mean, that's certainly been the tricky part with him is not making the lead too early. Having said that, you know, when I've watched the race over and over again, I, I don't think Flintshire was ever coming back at him. He still dug in. Uh, Johnny really barely hit this horse. He might have shaken him up a little bit just before the wire, but um, he really did it quite comfortably, I think. And you now have the favorite to unseat Wise Dan as the champion turf male. You've got a threat for horse of the year with main sequence. How's it feel? Look, it's exciting just to be considered for those, for those honors. Um, I think any trainer dreams of, of training a champion. I was fortunate enough to do it with Animal Kingdom. He was three-year-old champion. And, and to be in the consideration for the horse of, of the year, it's, it's very exhilarating and it's it's something, I think, you know, when you set off training, you hope one day you might train a champion, but to have the chance to train two is a dream come true. Well, you're going to be a busy man later this afternoon. You've got a couple of runners at Del Mar going in the featured red carpet, so we'll get some of your feelings about, first of all, appealing Cat, who will go there this afternoon, a close third in Keeneland's Dowager and last. Yeah, this was a big step up for her. Um, first of all, running, you know, kind of a marathon distance and then against open company. Um, she'd obviously won the restricted Pennsylvania bred race in her previous start, which I thought was a very good effort. But I, I was very pleased with how she ran in the Dowager. 
and obviously that gave me the encouragement to take a shot here in the red carpet. And Graham, the Dowager at a mile and a half was her first ever start beyond nine furlongs. Should that help her as far as today? I think it will. I mean, I think this is probably what she wants to do. She's a little bit of a confusing filly in as much in the morning. She's very aggressive, and I've always thought of her as more of a miler. But I think, uh, I think this is probably what her future is. Um, I really do. And you also have in this afternoon's red carpet Lady of Gold coming off a second in the maple leaf over the synthetic at Woodbine. Tell us about Lady of Gold. Yeah, again, I thought that was a big step for her. She has a tendency to break a step slow this filly, and that's why we wanted to try the longer distances, because it just doesn't hurt you as badly. Um, but I, I thought her effort in Canada was very good, and as you know, these longer races are few and far between, so that's why they both show up here in California today. At Calder this afternoon, you run a very interesting filly from the main sequence owners uh, by the name of Magic of Reality. One start here in the United States. We're about to take a look at a piece of it, her Keeneland allowance. She is next to last at the top of the screen for our audience. Graham, tell us about Magic of Reality. Yeah, I thought she was a little unlucky in this race. If I, if I remember rightly, right around the eighth pole, perhaps she had to steady a little bit, maybe a little before, um, which I think we, we thought um, might have might have cost her the race. Um, this wasn't the original race I'd planned for her. I'd wanted to run her a mile and a quarter earlier in the Keenan meet, and it came off the grass. So the mile ended up being a backup. But I think these longer races, I think the mile and eighth today will really suit her. Would you expect that she should move forward off this effort at Keeneland? I hope so. I mean, you never know when these fillies come over. Um, but she's had plenty of time to recover. She's done well since. I was a little pro surprised, perhaps, to see she was that short a price in the morning line. Um, but, you know, I think she's a legi le legitimate contender. And we are watching the final 16th of a mile right now, and she is a little bit tight in between fillies down there. So Edgar Prado rides for you this afternoon in Florida, no, um, weather-wise, firm turf, good turf. Any concerns for you with her? No, I mean, I'm a little concerned about the weather forecast. They, there's a chance they could get some, some more rain. I think they had some yesterday. They were off the grass yesterday. Um, but having said that, it shouldn't be an issue for this filly. She's handled, um, you know, softish conditions before, obviously. You also have a pair entered for the tropical turf rapscallion who won very nicely in the slop and last. If it's on the grass, what about turf for him? Yeah, I mean, I planned to run him on the turf. I've always thought he was more of a turf horse. We just experimented last time on the dirt, and he handled it very well. We did geld him before his last start, so that could be something to do with, with the improvement. Eh? He was a horse that showed a lot of ability in the morning and just wasn't quite getting it done in the afternoon, so perhaps the gelding uh, got his attention. And you'll also be running Edge of Reality in there, who was a close fourth in a Keeneland allowance in last. Yeah, this is a cool horse. I mean, he seems to handle everything. He's running the synthetic, the dirt. I really liked his grass races last year. If he gets the right trip, I'd definitely like to think he'd be competitive. And finally, next Sunday in Southern California, the Matriarch, and you've got Strathnaver, and we remember her as a very unlucky loser of a couple of races here in New York, one at Belmont, one at Saratoga. Graham, how's she doing coming up to the Matriarch? She's doing great. I'm just getting ready to watch the train here this morning. Um, this will probably be her swan song. I think this will be her last race. I, it was a bonus that I got to, to train her this year, but I think next year she'll be, she'll be making babies. Um, she's a lovely filly. I, I'm, it's been a frustrating year for her, and it would be great if we could get the win in the Matriarch. All congratulations again on the great successes with Main Sequence, the victory in the Breeders' Cup turf. Best of luck this afternoon on both coasts. Good luck with Strathnaver. We'll uh, wish you a happy Thanksgiving and look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Okay, thank you. And to you guys. Thank you, Graham. Graham Motion, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, he and his staff did an absolutely magnificent job with Main Sequence. And we are up. 
to our next break. When we return, we'll be off to Louisiana to be joined by Mr. Jim Cassidy. As we go to this break, the Red Smith at Aqueduct and the Fortify favorite, number four big, Blue Kitten. So we'll take a look at the Red Smith to the break. Back with Jim Cassidy right after these messages. And they're off from the inside, Margano. Now moving up is Legendary. In between horses is Micromanage. As the field goes for the far turn the first time, Micromanage now goes to the front with Legendary in second and Margano back running in third. Calvados is in fourth. On the outside is Managar in fifth. Length and a half to Dynamic Sky Racing in sixth. Can't help believing is in seventh. The field now comes into the stretch. It's Micromanage leading Legendary. Morgano on the inside runs in third. And Calvados is next in fourth. And the gray, Gelding, Managar in fifth by a head. Dynamic Sky is sixth. St. Albans boy. And on the outside, it's Unitarian. In between horses, can't help believing. And Big Blue Kitten is 10th and last, about a dozen lengths from the lead as the field goes into the clubhouse turn. Micromanage on the lead here. Micromanage three quarters of a length. Legendary is racing in second. Margano in a good spot there down towards the inside in third with Calvados alongside in fourth. At a break of three, back to Managar in fifth. Then it's Dynamic Sky and Unitarian, followed by St. Albans Boy. Big Blue Kitten has moved up a spot. Can't help believing is now the trailer there. Midway up the back stretch. Micromanage challenged here by Legendary. It's Micromanage on the inside and Legendary on the outside. It's a length to Calvados in third. Morgano runs in fourth. Then comes Managar in fifth. Followed by Dynamic Sky. Unitarian is now gaining ground on the outside. Then St. Albans Boy, Big Blue Kitten still at the back with Can't Help Believing. And the field is coming for the head of the stretch. Micromanage has dropped out of it. Legendary has the lead as they head for home. Legendary in front by almost three. Then it's Margano, Calvados, Dynamic Sky looks to rally down at the rail, and now they're closing in. Here comes Dynamic Sky. Here comes Margano on the outside. Legendary back in third, and here's Big Blue Kitten who arrives on the scene, but arrives on the scene late. Dynamic Sky in front, Big Blue Kitten second. Dynamic Sky wins the Red Smith handicap. Big Blue Kitten was second, and Margano finished third. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. With live horse racing on more than 250 flat-screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere, the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. My thanks to Graham Motion once again for having joined us in Dynamic Sky for Mark Cassie. And Cornelio wins his first ever race on turf as he parlays a beautiful inside trip into a length and a quarter victory over the late running Big Blue Kitten in the Red Smith. Our next guest this morning has a lightly raced and very talented colt Going in this afternoon's million dollar Delta jackpot, the two year old is Ocho 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 and his trainer, Mr. Jim Cassidy. Jim Marcasano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Uh, nice to be here. How are you, Mark? Good, Jim. How are you? Let's talk about Ocho 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 and tell us early on how did he train for you leading up to his debut? Well, when, we, uh, when he was at Del Mar, he wasn't. Uh, much of a synthetic uh, horse. He didn't like the synthetic much at all. So, But as soon as we got back on the dirt, he seemed to cherish that, and he, he went forward immediately, and uh, I was very happy with him. 
Well, we are about to take a look at his debut on October 11th at Santa Anita. For our audience, he is number two. Jim, talk about this effort. Was this basically what you were expecting out of him? Well, you never know the first time. I mean, I knew he, I knew he could run, and I knew he was fast. Uh, there were some decent horses in the race, so uh, it was it was kind of hard to judge. Uh, he got um, he got bet uh, mainly because of his work up leading up to that. So, but you never know about a first time starter. And but uh, he did everything right, and uh, certainly Joe Calamo rode him well, and uh, and they ran him uh, very fast. I was quite impressed, actually. Jim, for us to take a look at him, he is a son of a Kentucky Derby winner, Street Sense, and he's here debuting at five and a half furlongs. Well, yeah, I, I regardless of what I consider the, um, the, what they're going to get eventually, I like to sprint him a couple of times and uh, get the experience and um, and and get the uh, the dead fitness in him and. Uh, and that's basically what happened. So uh, you know, he was going to sprint one way or the other, whether he wanted to run a mile and a quarter or not. Him on the screen in a moment. Would you please take a moment to describe him for our audience? What's he like physically, and uh, what's he like mentally as well? Well, in the beginning, we had uh, considered he was he was a bit of a boy. We considered uh, maybe cutting him because he was acting quite foolish, but uh, he settled down, and uh, he's still a good feeling cold. He doesn't do anything wrong now, not wood. He's not an overly big horse. Um, he's got a great, great stride. Uh, he's one of those that when he when he gets down, he really lowers himself into the ground and really gets down down to it. He's, um, I, I'd say he's got a stride of a big horse, uh, but he's not, he's not that big. He's but he's well put together. He's uh, very well balanced and good, uh, good attitude about him on the racetrack. Jim, you brought him back in three weeks for his second start. Now, the juvenile turf sprint was eventually moved to the main track. Were you hoping it would be moved to dirt, or would you have run him down the hill on the grass? No, I, I had planned on running him down the hill. Um, we, we decided to run him there mainly because that, uh, that was – Next was for us. So, um, and so when it came off, they, they, you know, I I know that people at Santa Anita asked me if they were hoping if I hoped it came off, and I I really didn't even consider it. So we had we had fully intended on running on the grass. So uh, there you have it. And we just it just so so happened that he uh, uh, became up a sloppy track. Well, we are about to take a look at the juvenile turf sprint move to the main track. Ocho, Ocho, Ocho for our audience. Number three, Jim, he was inside under pressure early on and drew away. Talk about this impressive effort. Well, the first, my first thought was I was going to kill Talamo because they went to half in 43. <laughs> That was my first thought, and uh, and you know, of course, you know, you break your maiden. It's one thing, and when you run against winners um, in that kind of a race, you never know. That's right. But the way he uh, the way he handled it, I, <laughs> he certainly impressed me even more so than he did in his maiden race. So, to show those kind of fractions and to finish the way he did. Uh, Legitimately, he was he was getting out a little bit at the end, but I, I kind of assume he was getting pretty tired. But it was a fabulous effort. So, and there you have it. And it brought us up to today. Joe Talamo has ridden him in both of his starts. What has he said to you? Well, he's not talking to me right now. <laughs> because you replaced him today. Well, I replaced them. I couldn't get a commitment from his agent, um, you know, a solid commitment, because they, they were going to ride uh, Michael McCarthy's horse in the race, and he was only also eligible. So I kept telling him I need, a, you know, I need a solid commitment. And when they asked me if I could wait a little longer, or at least his agent did, I said, no, I can't wait longer. So I got my man Mike to ride him. That's basically what happened there. 
Well, there's nothing, nothing wrong with having Mike Smith up in a million dollar race for you. Now, Jim, Ocho 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 is obviously quick, but he yeah. looks, he looks at least with sprinters fractions, he looks to be somewhat rateable. What about going two turns today, you know, and getting middle distance fractions? Do you think he'll settle for Mike? Yeah, I, I, he, there's no reason why he wouldn't. I mean, he's never been one of those that, that uh, he wants to run off with you or, or get too aggressive. I mean, he's going to be a little bit aggressive coming out of two sprints, certainly. But I, I think Mike will get him settled. Uh, the 10 post is a bit of a, a chore because we have to try and get over as best we can. We'll get a long run for the first turn. Um, if If he settles for him, which I expect he will, um, I expect to be in a decent position, I'm afraid. Going two turns for the first time is always uh, an obstacle, of course. Uh, normally, if I wanted a horse to go t- the two turns, I would do two sprints, and that's exactly what this horse has had. So uh, I don't think it's a matter of conditioning. It's a matter of whether he'll, he'll get it or not. Now, of course, that's always a question mark. He's had a couple of 5 eights works since the last race, both 101 and 3. How did those works go? They go. They went well. In fact, Mike worked them the last, worked them the last time. He said, uh, he told me, he said he, he would have done anything I asked. He got a little bored late, but that was it. I, I just worked by himself. I wasn't looking to do anything fancy. I just uh, keep uh, turning them over and uh, just keeping good condition on them. Jim, how did he ship to Louisiana? How's he acclimated uh, with his new surroundings? You know, Mark, everything has been great. You know, the first time he was on an airplane, because when I brought him out of Florida, I didn't fly him. I banned him. So he'd never been on an airplane before. He handled it great. Uh, he, uh, he settled in. This morning, uh, we walked him this morning. He was being this little butthead self, wanting <laughs> brains and that, and that silly, but uh, other than that, he's, he's, been, he's been great. No problem eating everything. So I'm going in in 100% condition. That's all I can tell you. <clears throat> if we get it done, we get it done. If we don't, it's not to anyone's fault. You know, it's a pretty remarkable run. He, he debuted just six weeks ago, and later this afternoon, he's got a legitimate chance at a million-dollar race. Yeah, I... Uh, I know it's been it's been quick. It's been quick. Uh, but at least after this, uh, win, lose, or draw, we'll uh, we'll give him a little chance to take a breath and uh, probably not start him again until late in January. Before we let you go, you've also got a runner in this afternoon's fifth at Delta, the Treasure Chest, Yahilwa. How's she doing? Yeah, she's doing well. Um, yeah, it was, uh, she's a She's a good mare. She uh, she shows up all the time. She runs hard. She's tough. Um, Mike's ridden her before. Uh, he um, he got he got. Uh, I think he finished second on her one time on the turf. Uh, but she's uh, she's a straightforward girl. She um, she gives you everything she's got just about every time. So um, at least I'll uh, hopefully um, that race comes up first so I can concentrate on her for a while and take the pressure off me for the seventh race. Well, Jim, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch and all the best later this afternoon with Ocho, Ocho, Ocho and Yahilwa at Delta Downs. Thanks very much, Mark. Jim Cassidy, ladies and gentlemen, this is a fascinating cult. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting that Joe Talamo and his agent wouldn't make a commitment because Mike McCarthy's horse, who they had ridden last time, you know, they didn't know if he was going to draw into the race. I don't know if that meant that Talamona's agent preferred to ride the McCarthy horse, but if Mike Smith can save some ground going to that first turn and get Ocho, Ocho, Ocho to relax, and coming off a couple of sprints, as you heard Jim say, you know, he's probably going to be a little keyed up early on, but if Mike can get him to settle, that's going to be a he's got a he's got an interesting chance 
in this afternoon's Delta Jackpot. And we are up to our final break. When we return, it's off to Kentucky, where we'll welcome Mr. Brendan Walsh. As we go to this break, the DeFrancis Dash from Laurel, formerly a grade one, now an ungraded $350,000 stakes, nine to five favorite, number five dad's caps, seven to two second choice, number six burn identity. So we will take a look at the DeFrancis Dash to the break, back with Brendan Walsh right after these messages. Off of the Frank J. DeFrancis Memorial Dash. Happy My Way sent up for the early lead, but there too is Favorite Tail and Zebros. Three of them are running together in the opening furlong, and Dad's Caps is in fourth position. Then Burn Identity is next in fifth. Five or six lengths off the pace up ahead. Smash and grab. Bobbled at the beginning. Back to third last position. And Heaven's Runway. And Miko Margarita has got double digits to make up. Some 13 off that pace. 22 seconds was the opening quarter mile. And Favorite Tail down to the inside is ahead in front from Zebros in second. Dad's Caps rating beautifully at this point with two and a half furlongs left to go. Looming up there. Happy My Way is back and forth. Burn Identity is fifth. Four for the leaders. Followed by Smash and grab to the outside. Back to Heaven's Runway. Miko Margarita. They make the turn for home. Zebros. Dad's cap set down to the outside. A 44 and four half mile. And Zebros is there. Zebros still going. No signs of stopping at all for Zebros. Zebros scorching home. Happy my way. Trying to regather up on the inside. Dad's caps. And then down to the inside. His favorite tail and burn identity. Zebros and Jose Ortiz smoked them. To win by three. Happy my way. Burn identity. Then favorite tail. Dad's caps, followed by Heaven's Runway, Smash and Grab, and Miko Margarita in 108.77, the Frank J. DeFrancis Memorial Dash going to Zebros. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off Track Betting. Looking for a racing partnership with proven success? Bloodlines Racing is for you. Using genetic profiling, Bloodlines horses are bred from some of the most successful thoroughbreds in the world. Horses like Distorted Beauty and Invading Humor have won six of their last seven races over the summer and together have delivered to our partners more than $366,000 in earnings. For our latest offerings and opportunities, visit us at bloodlinesracing.com. Bloodlines Racing, racing quality. I got it. Watch me. I got it. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got a move that tells me what to do. If you don't, brothers and sisters, then you won't know what it's all about. Looking for something to do on Black Friday that doesn't include going to the mall? Head down to the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany, and join Tim Wilkin and Mike Jarbo for a special Team Bankroll Challenge. Tim and Mike will be wagering $500 on behalf of 25 lucky patrons. There'll be lots of excitement and a free buffet courtesy of Legends Field Restaurant and Pub. So forget the mall and join the Times Union's Tim Wilkin and Mike Jarbo at the Clubhouse Racebook, and let's wager and win together. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Jim Cassidy once again for having joined us. And Zebros, the longest shot in the race for Wayne Lucas and substitute rider Jose Ortiz stalks the pace, takes over, and handily wins the DeFrancis Dash at 29 to 1. Our final guest this morning is a first timer to the program. Later this afternoon, he will send out Biddy Kitty in her stakes debut in the grassy Cardinal at Churchill Downs. We welcome in live via telephone, Mr. Brendan Walsh. Brendan, Mark Cassano welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. It's nice to have you. Brendan, as a first timer to the program, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I just started training, Mark, um, about three years ago exactly now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's going pretty good. I had my first uh, 
my first stakes winner this year with Kerry Street. And um, hopefully we can add to that today, Mark. Yes, we hope so for you. You know, Brendan, for, for a young man who's only been out on his own for a short period of time, you've already got a third in the Breeders' Cup. You ran third with Worldly in, in the 2013 marathon, and he was right there turning for home. That must have been very exciting. Yeah, it was fantastic, Mark. Um, he, was a, he was a nice horse to have um, last year. He was the first... Uh, stakes caliber horse I um that I happened to have really so it was a big boost to uh to the whole thing and um you know we were we were sad to lose him last year but um we we found a nice replacement with him this year uh Kerry Street and he he won the equivalent to, even though it's not a Breeders Cup race anymore he won the equivalent of the marathon there uh two weeks ago uh three weeks ago actually so um that was fantastic to go back there and um and get uh, get some sort of um, you know get some sort of revenge. Well, let's talk Biddy Kitty. When did you get her, uh, and what were your early impressions of her? I had her at two, Mark, um, and you know I loved her. Uh, we ran her a couple of times. She ran first time at Kentucky Downs and and ran a really nice race. Went by a. Um, a bunch of them and just got tired and there was a couple of re there was a grade one winner in that race and a, another good stakes filly as well um, and she got tired and then we ran her back at Keeneland and she got in a bit of trouble and um, you know we sent her out we thought she needed time to mature which she did and um, you know she got sent up to to New York uh, Mrs. Mosley has some some horses in New York as well she sent her up there and she didn't really didn't really caught it up there, um, so she sent her back to me last winter in Florida, and um, I think Palm Meadows really turned her around. Mark, she she was uh, she was a little nervous was what was wrong, and she probably didn't the, the race track probably wasn't getting the best out of her. So you know we we kind of used a little bit of a different method in in Palm Meadows and um, got her to relax, and she started to uh, to find her form, and once she you know once she started some decent races and you know finally we got her head in front she's gone from strength to strength since well we're about to watch a piece of her allowance win two back at kentucky downs for our audience she is number three in the green and white silks to the far right of your screen you know brendan a little inconsistent the first couple of times you ran her a couple of nice efforts but now four in a row this came off a of freshening Talk about this performance. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. You know, we were we were contemplating bringing her to Saratoga uh, to run up there, but you know, we said there was there was good uh, a good purse with this race at um, at Kentucky Downs, and you know, she probably needed just a small bit of a of a freshening at the time anyway. So we said we'd hold out till September, and uh, you know, she's not a filly that takes a ton of a ton of getting getting uh, fit so you know she was going to be fine off of the layoff and uh, you know I think it, it did her more good more than anything um, you know so uh, she won well there you know I knew from the first time we had ran her there that she was probably going to be able to handle the track cause it's a it's a track that takes a bit of handling um, and she handled it really well and you know once again I mean they were they were a nice bunch of fillies with a hundred thousand dollar purse they were a nice bunch of fillies and she uh she, she was pretty impressive. Well, she was also impressive in her last start. We're about to take a look at a piece of this October 11th allowance at Keeneland for our audience. Biddy Kitty is number six. She is sixth in the two path at the top of the screen. Again, a nice late kick for her fourth victory in a row. Brendan, do you think that overcoming the nervousness has played that much of a part in her success? Um, I think that's part of it, Mark. I think the other thing is, you know, she's learned how to win. And, and I think that's, um, you know, that's very important to her. So she's got a ton of confidence, you know. I mean, it, it shows in the morning, it shows in the afternoon. Um, and, and you know, she, she, she's she got so much confidence now. She, she thinks she's... Uh, 
you know, that she can she can run against anybody. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's amazing what it'll do for a horse. And uh, you know, we're hoping for a big big run again today. How's she doing coming up to the race? Doing great, Mark. We've had a, a very awkward week yeah. uh, with the cold here in Kentucky. Um, so we've, you know, there's, there was three, four days where we weren't even allowed out in the track. It was closed. Um, you know, so I'm not too concerned about it. Um, you know, she's raised face and everything, but, you know, it's not ideal. Um, but everybody, well, you know, I mean, there's not really this one filly, I guess, shipping in, but... Uh, Everybody else has been under the same circumstances. I don't think it's going to inconvenience her that much. But, it's, you know, you don't like to see it. But at the same time, uh, I don't think it's going to, going to do her any harm. With uh, Corey Lannery in Louisiana riding in the Million Dollar Delta jackpot, Robbie Alvarado will ride her for the first time. Now, Brendan, is she a difficult filly to ride if you don't know her? Or is she, is she pretty straightforward? Ooh. I don't think so. Um, you know, obviously Corey's ridden her a bunch of times and he, he knows her well, but, you know, there's no, I mean, somebody like Robbie, you know, it's, if she's good enough, he'll, he'll win on her. It's as simple as that. He, he rides this track as good as anybody. Um, you know, and she just, she, she just finds herself in a race. She, she breaks out of there. She puts herself in a, in a position, you know, maybe four or five lengths off the lead and, and, you know, hopefully they'll they'll go a nice pace and she'll kick in at the end. And um, you know, she she likes Churchill. She she's won here twice already this year. So um, you know, I think if she's good enough, then then uh, Robbie's not uh, Robbie's not going to inconvenience her whatsoever. He he knows every this track like the back of his hand. So I think it uh, it uh, I'm looking forward to having him ride her actually. Well, Brendan, all congratulations on the successes with uh, Biddy Kitty. I mean, you turned her around four in a row. We hope she makes it five in a row later in the Cardinal. And thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Thank you, Mark. Brendan Walsh, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be a fascinating race. Now, got something to talk to you about. Uh, Thanksgiving week, of course, next week in a very special event here at the Clubhouse Racebook at 711 Central Avenue next Wednesday. Roddy Valente, the Valente family, and his business, RJ Valente Gravel and Capital OTB, will be giving away 800 turkeys on a first come, first serve basis to needy families. Now, this is again next Wednesday, the 26th the day before Thanksgiving, from noon until 3, here at the Clubhouse Racebook, next door to ShopRite at 711 Central Avenue. This is a very nice thing that Roddy and his family are doing. You know, Roddy's worked hard. He's been very successful, and now he's helping other people, and I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Here's a quote from Roddy on the giveaway and I'm quoting as a local business we are looking forward to interacting with the community to support struggling families especially during the holidays we're proud to be working with John Signor of OTB to make this happen we would like to thank our customers for their support throughout the year which allows us to help others end quote so that's a wonderful thing next Wednesday if you know of any needy families who could use a turkey, pass this along, please. Next Wednesday, the 26th, from noon until 3, right here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven in the parking lot, 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany, next door to ShopRite. The first 800 needy folks will receive a turkey on a first-come, first-serve basis and uh, that's a wonderful thing that Roddy and his family and Capital OTB are doing. It will uh, make Thanksgiving quite special for a lot of folks. All right, time to wrap it up and thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air. 
here at the studios at the Clubhouse Racebook in Albany. Our associate producer, Julie Hoxie and Mick Richards back in the control room in Schenectady. Pat Peretta directed, Dan Hayes on audio. Our guests, thank you so much to Graham Motion, Brendan Walsh and Jim Cassidy. And thanks to our sponsor, Bloodlines Racing. Racing quality horses like Full Sisters Invading Humor and Distorted Beauty for information on their latest offering. A half-sister to both of those outstanding fillies, go to bloodlinesracing.com. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay warm. Have a very, very happy Thanksgiving. Remember that turkey giveaway next Wednesday. Have a wonderful weekend and a terrific upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.